Thank you very much, Mr. President Scott. And let's do a big rotary welcome to our two candidates today. Steve Representative Steve Derringer, Fort Townsend, and his uh, challenger, Brian Hood, the public enemy of President Carlson. Um, ballots, it's right in the corner. The election is November 8th. Ballots go out next Wednesday, so we'll all have them probably at this time next week. Um, we'll begin with our candidate's three minute opening statements. Followed by one minute follow ups if they wish and go to questions. Think of your questions now, please, on the rotary members. All the questions, of course, need to be addressed to each of the candidates, both of them, so they can answer them. And if you uh, to ask a question, just raise your hand. And out there in cyber world, we're watching you too. So, you know, let, let us know. Um, with that, let's go to the candidates and ask each of them to give us again a maximum of three minutes each why we should vote for them. And um, I'll hold up a, a card. We get the one minute. We've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> we flip the coin, and uh, uh, Steve uh, got heads. So he's going to be going first. And Steve, you come up here, and uh, off we go. Three minutes, please. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Rotary, for having us this morning. Um, I'm missing my Rotary Club and Swim, the Sunrise Rotary. So uh, uh, it's a little further dry here, but it's great. Um, thanks for having us. I am your state representative. I'm honored to have had that uh, your votes and your support for the last uh, 11 years and i'm asking for your vote again this cycle um a lot of you know me i was your county commissioner for 12 years and now i've been in the legislature for 11 years since you got my sixth term and, um and worked a lot in the legislature as chair of the capital budget to bring uh investments into the community the, the boys and girls club the pool the court um uh a couple of health, the health clinic, uh, dental clinic. So um, I'm a chair of the capital budget in the house. I'm on the appropriations committee and also the, the health and wellness committee. So I link those together, try to do uh, uh, provide a balanced um, approach to the issues we face here on the peninsula. I want to speak just a little bit about things we've done in healthcare. Um, that's the challenge, as we know, and the COVID really highlighted those challenges. One of the things was nursing education and support. And this last session, we increased the workforce and training by 47 million in the state budget. Uh, we had 37 million for tuition assistance and community placements, and then 174 million higher ed employee salaries. Part of the challenge is having instructors these days in community colleges and nursing programs because they can make pretty good dough outside in the you know in the in the market. So we had to we raised those salaries to be able to make sure we had the right folks that were training. Um, on the access issue, which is a big issue here in rural Washington um, and on the peninsula, we increased the um, telemedicine is an important feature. And we've been working on parity so that the folks that are providing the service with their neurologists, psychiatrists or whatever, that there's parity so they'll choose, they won't have to choose whether someone who's in their office as opposed to someone who's outside telemedicine. And then we provided, we expanded that for audio. So that really expands the ability to access expertise in the, in the healthcare field. There's more transparency now in our billing. billing, billing. Um, as you know, you can get out of, out of network billing. And so we just wanted to find out where the um, track our healthcare dollars more effectively, so there's more transparency. A lot of you would probably deal with the health care system. Know they could be pretty opaque and pretty challenging at times. Um, we capped insulin prices. You know, those went. They used to be around forty dollars a, a dose. They went up to six hundred dollars. You know, about six eight years ago. And so we stepped in at the state level and brought them back down to the to the thirty five dollars a dose, which is you know life saving for a lot of folks who are having to choose or dilute their their insulin and, um, and choose whether to get insulin at 600 bucks or you know food and housing um 
And uh, on public health care funding, you know, there was about 125 million for the Department of Health for COVID and uh, 22 million for child deaths. So glad to be here. Looking forward to your uh, your question. Thank you. Ryan. <clears throat> You're such a friendly guy, John. I see they kept waving up at this. <laughs> 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 well, my name is Brian Pruitt. Uh, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and I was retired from two careers in the military and federal civil service. Civil service, I divided up into two big things. Ecosystem management, I was called back to Washington, D.C. three times to help develop national regulations. Then I went into oil and gas development. I worked in mining three years before that. I've got quite extensive background in natural resource management and agriculture and human resources where they include things like equal opportunity, family programs, drug demand reduction, child and youth services, education services. Those five directors all worked for me. And I retired, but then I saw what was happening here to our Minnesota, to my state. And I saw what was going on in the legislature. And we had 11 anti-police laws passed. And the worst one, all the law enforcement officers, and now the mayors in 25 communities and places like Everett say the worst law passed is the no pursuit law because that triggers people to evade. And we've also seen uh, with the open borders, with Mr. Biden, we are seeing tons of drugs come in, literally tons of drugs come in. And the local law enforcement say we're seeing pounds of thieves down off here in Port Angeles. So if you're a businessman or a family member here in town, you witness the, uh, the dancing on the street corners and the gentleman with uh, no shirt on and their pants down on their knees, those are just some of the symptoms of the costs that we're seeing that's affecting everybody, including the children in our schools. And I want to address those. I want to get good police laws into effect, and I want to start building infrastructure. I have a broader vision than the incumbent in that I want to see a more accessible route to a life career in high school. We're in the 21st century now. I grew up in the 20th, and even then we had OTEC programs. That was just an opener. So if we don't give careers to our children and choices by age 18 to go out and get a good job that pays a living wage, then we're not going to tell everybody to lift up our community with resiliency that we need to have and a, a reliable career choice. Is that my time up? No, no. 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 Yeah. Okay, I just got five fingers up. So right. five minutes. There's five minutes. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, those are some of my priorities, but I think statewide we look at, look, need to look at changing the laws that impact our educational choices. And I think we need to look at things like banning the income tax that the incumbent voted for. It's in court right now. That was an illegal income tax. That's against our constitution. I think we have to have some common agreements in how we're going to live together. And a constitution is a good start. And then the laws that come down from that, I think we need to work on those. So I just give you a brief cursory introduction. If you want to check me out, I've got 10 priorities on the cards so they handed out that work for, for us. And I've got an extensive website with a lot of background on what I've done, like being awarded four meritorious service medals for quality recognition work, bronze star medal. I was selected for promotion in the military 10 times, and I was selected for promotion in my civilian career five times, and received 12 awards through individual awards there. That's proof that I know what I'm doing. I'll get it done for you. Thank you for having me here today. Steve, you have a one minute follow up? Yes. Um, so um, on the law enforcement uh, piece, uh, we were the legislature. Well, first of all, we, we all deserve to be safe in our communities uh, and feel safe, not just be safe, but feel safe. And there was an initiative passed back in uh, 2019, I-940, that, that stated that the legislature needs to do something around safety on both sides of the blue line. And so we, a lot of the reforms my opponent refers to were initiated with the folks that sponsored that, that initiative. And what we did is uh, last year, so that we have a two year by the first year of the by we passed 
six or seven laws, but one, a number of them have been very effective. A couple of them have had, we need to do further work on. Uh, one is the pursuit bill and that pivots on, and there's different departments interpreted differently. The attorney of police interpreted um, that it wasn't as restrictive. Uh, Washington Associated with Cops and Police, they interpreted it that it was totally restrictive. I think it's just kind of the legal counsel they got. But we're, we're going to fix that. We had a bill last year that I voted for that got through the the, the Senate and, or got through the House, um, but didn't quite get to the governors. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be fixing that. I think in, in uh, this coming session. Brian, one minute. Here are my two tours in Afghanistan. The first one I worked in the police reform directorate, dealing with. 11 provincial governors, so it's part of a reform team. And we work to establish safety and new law and order with national police and the border police too. And I will tell you that you can't just bumble around when it comes to the public safety. And that's what happened when you, you pass laws in a hurry, you get it through, but that they're not taking into account the, the requirements we need to have and the capabilities we have in our police force. So the idea that the the police don't know how to safety pursue people, that is fallacious. And to do what they did for our safety is wrongful. So I ask for your determination on whether you think that the police now are lying to us, or if the individual claiming that he's done a good job is somehow misstating the truth. Thank you. Why stay up there, Brian? We're gonna, we're gonna answer the first question. Good. Um, Scott? Uh, first of all, thank, thanks to both of you for coming. And joining us this morning, we appreciate it. Uh, so if, if, if you're elected, uh, you know, you, you each have a lot of different priority issues. Uh, but if, if you're elected, what, what is the, the, the most important issue that you'll address once elected? And more importantly, how are you gonna get that legislation passed? The most important issue is rebalancing the government. You know, we've been so lopsided so long that we have a lot of things that are passed in with the executive branch through commissions that are superseding the actual laws can be passed. It's like the Human Rights Commission is now making women into a second class category. And we need to work on things like uh, the health system that now says your insurance companies, if they won't pay for a little boys to be chemically castrated and they won't pay for 13 year old girls who want to have their mastectomies, then they are driven out of the state. So the healthcare industry has been devastated by the laws we passed, like that 5313, Senate Bill 5313, and the, the attempt to have long-term health care insurance, those things are driving insurance companies out of our state, and we are seeing our choices being limited with the drugs we have in our health care system. In the ER, I'm talking about the people that walk in and destroy the ER, and OMC, one call just last month, had to have five security guards respond, and that costs a lot of money. And the nurses don't like it. They get abused, they get terrorized, the equipment gets smashed up. And OMC is a critical resource here for us in our community. So to pump more money into a program is not offsetting the damage being done by the laws and permissiveness of drug abuse in this state now. Thank you, Steve. Most important issue. <clears throat> so every, you know, we're on a biennial cycle at the, at the state. We have the election in November, and then we we do a first year of the biennium was long session. It will be focusing. I think one of the major focuses for me will be the budget. That's a, a policy document, as a lot of folks know. And I sit on the appropriations committee. I also chair the capital budget committee. And we have been over the last couple of year, a couple of biennium. I think you know, even with COVID, because we're so sales tax generated, we've had pretty robust budget. Then we had. Um, federal money through the Infrastructure and Investment Act, and we had uh, money, COVID recovery money. Those dollars are not there. So our, I think what's going to be most important is how do we readjust our budget in these more challenging times? I think the economy, as all of us know, is, is not as robust as it was last year or two years ago. And so there'll be flattening revenue, and yet the demand is going to is still going to be there on Medicaid, for example, which is a state program to get matched from the federal government. But so, and as capital budget chair, I'm linked to our revenue. We have a formula that dictates how much 
bonding capacity we have. So we'll be adjusting those investments. So, and using that document to address the needs we have. In my opening statement, we talked about you know putting money into nursing, putting money into dental clinics, and putting money, and that's those are the things that um, we'll have to adjust. There's a lot of demand out there where they keep flattening. Steve, say up. Jim Jones. I'm interested in uh, where you believe we should go uh, in regards to gas tax. I mean, we see it every night on the news when they when they when they say you know we're five sixty one per gallon now in the state of Washington. It's national average is three ninety one, and and uh, <clears throat> that that we have the second or third highest whatever it is gas tax you know in the in the country. And it just seems to me that it, it is uh, obvious that as more and more people turn to electric vehicles and plug in hybrids, that not only is the amount of money that we need for our roads uh, and infrastructure going to decline because less people are buying gas, more of that burden, the gas tax is going to have to go up. Or something new is going to have to happen. I'd, I'd like to hear a question. Yeah, I, I would like <laughs> your opinion of how do we solve that problem? I think that's a two part question. One issue is the gas tax. Um, and we do have a high gas tax in Washington. As you look at the cost of oil per barrel, that's been fairly flat. The price of the pump has been quite erratic. I mean, there's differences of 30, 40 cents in a, in a given month, even though that price of growth. So, so it, it's, you know, that's beyond the legislator's ability to. There has been some talk, I, you know, back when the gas prices were going up about, uh, you know, us taking, lowering the state uh, amount. But because of the fluctuation, we weren't sure, and I, a number of Republicans, he's, he's a hunch in Arkansas, so, said he was not in favor of state lowering their gas tax. We weren't sure that those dollars would actually get to you at the pump because of that fluctuation. As far as the second part of the question, which is how do we fund transportation moving forward, uh, it's a challenge. There have been a couple of pilot programs in the state that are based on miles driven. So you, uh, you would have a transducer in your car that would track or some way to track that. It would probably be by county. And so you would, you know, you would be, you would be assessed when you probably get your tabs and set up some sort of structure and payment with the state. But it, if you look at it in the county, I talked actually to the chair of the transportation committee about this, uh, stage five, who actually blew up high school here in Port Angeles. Um, as to whether, because, you know, we travel here, right? I mean, my district is 350 miles around my district. If you're on an I-5 district, you get across your district, you know, maybe five miles, right? And you can cross in a half hour, takes two, two and a half, three hours. So we drive further. If there was a way we could adjust those rates for those of us in the rural county, but if we're doing it county by county, the challenge, of course, is that everybody from Bellevue come register their cars in Clapham. So it's, you know, that's actually what makes kind of America great is our ability to figure that kind of stuff. So, but we need to, we need to look at it and that's the long-term challenge is funding transportation. We put together transportation packages last year that did not have an, a, a gas tax increase. We took money, actually some of that one-time money that came from, uh, the federal government and our robust operating fund to fund a $16 billion transportation package of which, you know, the Elwha Bridge is still in the in the mix for getting that replaced. And we have improvements on Sindar's Road and the Palo Alto Road. Um, but that was put together by increasing your, your uh, vehicle registration by one-time money, both out of the capital money, capital budget and the operating budget and some of that federal dollars. And that, of course, is not a long-term um, solution. So we'll have to be get other solutions. Um, and probably will be something along the lines of miles driven as opposed to gallons of gas purchase. Brian, gas tax. Thank you. Remember when I was a kid, Run around in jeans. 
time I had put quarters in my pocket and they disappeared. Uh, I had a hole in my pocket. Well, we've got a big hole in our pocket too. I worked as an inspector general for three years. I went to Afghanistan my second time and I advised the Afghan army inspector general and we dig down into problems. We find out the best solution and we implement that. And we need to have a solution right now. When you go down to Bremerton, you'll see a $60 million fish overpass. And when you go out here, bust the town, you see a $28 million overpass. I would submit that we can manage our money a lot better. And one of the ways to do that is to start to get what we need paid for and limit the excess spending that's within our transportation budget. Has anybody here driven through the Morris Creek curve? Nobody drives cars here. <laughs> awesome. Why are you worrying about gas tax? <laughs> I, I have to say that I am against the latest two bills were passed to start the carbon <laughs> credit and to implement the new gas tax that starts January 1st. And I'm against the increase in fees when we voted twice, three times actually, to implement a $30 car tab fee. And now there are $300 because keep learning more fees. Roads are extremely critical to us. And we have a 38 mile stretch south of Forks that is critical to our economy for the county. Marketing timber products is one of the primary sources of income and employment for us in this county. And we ignore that. That road is horrible if you go south of Forks. And if you go the other way, you go to Morse Creek. And I think we need to get more accountability by establishing a state law that will require an audit and oversight for our transportation department. Another problem we have within the DOT budget is all the employees refuse to sign over their health records to state review. That includes the VACs, but the, the documents they had said, I released my records. No, people want privacy. There's actually a federal act called HIPAA that restricts people from accessing your medical records. The people that refuse to sign that, were fired. One of my friends is the guy that repaired the ferry boat engines. Well, now the new bill that was just passed is going to buy four new ferry boats because they're not going to repair the old ones because they fired the employees that fixed them. It's nonsensical, it's tragic, and we don't need to be wasting more money by bad policies such as voting in to extend the government of the emergency power vested in Governor Inslee. We need to terminate that at 30 to 60 days and stop him from taking these actions that are costing us billions of dollars and lost lives, lost careers. That's why we need to rebalance our legislature. And that's why I'm asking for your vote to help me get in there and get some common sense back into decisions. The gas taxes, I'm against the two that are passed. The carbon tax credit has already been priced in to the fuel suppliers, supply chain. That's why we're seeing a higher cost here now before the new gas tax kicks in on January 1st. There's no reason to waste more money and take more money from you and keep stuffing that hole in your pocket. They have, uh, just, uh, they have one. Okay. We have anything online at all? No. no. Okay. Mine's short and sweet, John. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. All right. I was just wondering if you believe in the legitimacy of the current presidency. Is Washington State electoral system safe? And will you, um, will you, would you challenge if you lost the vote? Okay, three questions in one. Yeah. Let me see. Do I re do I believe in the legitimacy of the presidency of the United States? That's the first part. Yes, I believe our presidency is a legitimate presidency. Are you okay? I believe I have a different opinion about the individual in the office, but that's my own personal opinion. So your next question. Okay, did, wait a minute. Did you answer that? Did you, no. Do you believe that Joe Biden was, was legally voted? Question four. No. Was, yeah, no. The legitimacy of the presidency is an entirely different thing. I believe that Joe Biden was elected by the people, and I believe that he is uh, he is going to complete his term. The completed term means he's a legitimate president. I would tell you that everybody else recognizes around the world as making decisions for the United States right now. Does that answer that part of the no, question? No, it's very cagey, but thank you. Well, okay. Uh, okay. The next part of your question was again? 
Yeah, that's another part. <clears throat> if you if you do not win this election, will you challenge it? Do you think uh, that our system is safe here? If I don't win, uh, I don't think I can answer that question now reasonably because uh, I worked as inspector general. I, I try to avoid projecting theoretical <clears throat> answers. But I will tell you this, I ran for office two years ago. I did not win. I did not contest the election. If that establishes a pattern of behavior, then hopefully that'll be satisfactory to you. And the third question again. We're I just asked. Okay, we're all right. Okay. <laughs> Steve. I think as we learned through the congressional hearings on January 6th, um, that the big lie is an orchestrated effort to threaten our electoral process. And it continues to threaten our electoral process and therefore our democracy. And so um, the fact that they're still questioning, people still believe in that big lie is, is a travesty. And I don't think there's any question, what there were 63 different court cases and examinations on the validity of the Biden election and the vote counts in different states. So I don't think there's any question that, he, that the president was legitimately elected and the process was legitimate. As far as our process, um, back when I was a commissioner here, you know, we were the second county in the state, this is about 2001, 2002, that went to an all mail in ballot. And it actually saved us about $30,000 back then for election. Plus we were able to get a written record and then you, so that there's no question of chads or, or voting machines, the signatures are examined and, and, and compared, the one that's on record with the one that's on the ballot. And then as a commissioner, if you were chair of the board, and I was that several times, I was on the candidacy board. And there were out of 30, 35,000 votes, there were maybe 400 or so that came to us to, have to review. Uh, where the signatures didn't match. Some of them, they're just word signatures. Those were easily decided. You threw those out. A lot of them were, were elder spouses, and uh, one spouse had tried to maybe write in the signature for their, uh, their partner, um, and, you know, we had to throw those out. But in, in you know, numerous elections, 35,000 ballots, we had maybe four or five votes that were contested. So I think our system is very secure, certainly with the, with in Washington with the with the mail in ballot. And you wouldn't challenge, challenge your oh no, I know, no, I I no, I what I no. <laughs> the first time I was elected county commissioner, part of the mail in ballot here in Washington, right, is you get to submit your ballot, as you all know, the election day is postmarked by eight. So you don't get the results till you know one or two weeks. The first time when I was a little well, I elected. The commissioner, um, we had to do a recount, and I was not, I didn't know whether I was elected or not until like the first week of December. So that's kind of a challenge, but I honestly accept the results because I think the system is very secure and should be trusted. If you could stay up there, Steve. Yeah. Ah, uh, both of you mentioned healthcare uh, early on in your statements today, and one of the challenges that we face out here, being rural areas, access to special specialty care, and in, nationally, a lot of mid-level practitioners, PAs, optometrists, they are trained to do things that they're not legislatively able to do in certain states, and there are a lot of states that are voting to expand the scope of mid-level practitioners to pick up the slack for specialists that are in service supply. So what are your thoughts on this process? Is it something you would support for Washington or not? Um, it's a great question. It's a, these are, um, on the healthcare committee we deal with, they're called scope of practice. Um, and they're, um, they're challenging, uh, I will say for a citizen legislature to determine in fact, I was on a meeting last night. There's been a debate between ophthalmologists and optometrists. The, opto uh, the optometrists say there's this new laser machine 
that they can be able to provide some surgeries for the eye through this machine. The ophthalmologists say, no, they don't have that training. And so that's, I think it, that's an example of what is most important is to what is the certification? What is the training? What is the, um, you know, the background that, you know, the folks that are asking to expand their scope bring to that discussion. Um, basically, I look at those, those questions for us and, and you mentioned, Doctor, the, the challenge for access to healthcare in rural areas here. So I, I, I want to expand access as much as possible, but I, also it's got to be quality care for healthcare. So you have to make sure that you're not sacrificing that quality for that expansion of service. In my opening remarks, I mentioned how you know, telemedicine is becoming more and more uh, usable and I think effective for us in rural areas. So I think that's maybe a better way to, to help access some of those uh, challenging neurology, psychiatry, um, that you know we just don't have the population support here, but you can access that through telemedicine. As far as just scope of practice, I look at each one individually and, and try to decide, uh, again, whether it's gonna improve access and whether it's safe and it has good quality healthcare. I don't just categorically, you know, accept Brian? When I worked in human resources, I worked with uh, reviewing credentials. We had committees set up and we were preparing people to take on missions, go somewhere, set up projects. We had to review those and we relied strongly upon the professional organizations for their input and what we felt was needed for, the, for those purposes. So yes, but I would say we need to have that input before we make more laws on this. But that said, we do have some problems with existing laws here in the state. One of those involves telemedicine. Telemedicine can be very good, very effective, and provide certain types of services. But what we have now, unfortunately, is laws that were passed by the current legislator that allow 13-year-olds to get psychiatric meds and get surgical procedures without parental knowledge and without parental knowledge of the bills being sent to their providers, to the insurance companies. That is a problem that, that was incurred. And so I disagree with, we went too far. Legislators went too far when they passed those laws, bills. Now there's a chart. You go and see which services can be obtained by children at those different ages. And I really agree with the people that say 18 year olds is a good age to make those decisions independent of parental involvement. So when you're talking about the services provided, such as the expansion of abortion services for ARMPs to have now and non-physicians, I think that was a step too far when you apply it to those age classes of children. So I, those are some of the boundaries I see as far as what we want to do and provide for the state. Okay. Do we have a question online? No. No, we don't. But I had a question. Oh, John, got it. <laughs> what is your, um, yeah, do you have an opinion and or plan as to related to mental health services? Which part of mental health services? Um, just the whole, broadly, whole picture. Yeah, the whole picture. Oh, what right. is it? I, I don't I know. <laughs> yeah. Providing, need, I guess. I think we need to have full spectrum. And that means that I want to see at the top end, the most dire need is to have effective state mental health hospitals. That's the missing link right now. And it's placing an undue burden on our jails, on the prisons, who are having to provide those level services now. Because when, we, when I was growing up as a kid here in Washington, we had five state mental health hospitals. And over the years, a Governor Greg Lohr shut one down, 900 bed facility. That left us with two, Medical Lake and one down here in Western Washington. And when the current administration allowed these, this 900 bed facility to become decertified, that really cut the legs out of what we need to have as far as the extreme level where you need to get people out of their squalor, get them in a supervised setting with a clean bed, medicines, food, showers. That's what we need to reestablish. And that's a big movement. That, I've heard estimates of $600 million to get that, but we need it, and we had a $17 billion surplus, actually 19, no. but that was spent on other things. <laughs> now we have a lot of programs right here in town and in the county, but I'd like to see those sustained. 
But I think that we're doing things, you know, in terms of mental health, we couple that with addiction, then we have some real issues going on. The issues as far as safety of the housing we put them into, the safety on the streets, and the current law enforcement situation has enabled more addiction because of the 11 anti-police laws. The most, most urgent need is that ability to pursue people who are stealing, generally speaking, uh, the law officers or two of their hiring things when they steal cars and go running down the street with more, or start bashing the cars. So that prevents a very, a very real danger to public safety when you have mentally ill people with drugs and, and the crime kind of goes along with that. So if you, you need to deal with each, each part of that individual, housing, mental health, drugs, and crime. I think we need to establish three things that is when we started on was the mental health court. We need to have a family court and we need to have a drug court as well to deal with those complex issues that we have. And if people refuse to participate, then we need to isolate them from the benefits that we're providing. And that's, that may be harsh too, but you know, I don't believe in low barrier housing because the, the uh, social workers tell us that <clears throat> An addict that you put into housing has a 60% higher likelihood of dying from drug overdose. Is that what we're trying to do? <laughs> put them in a situation where we get a, a higher death rate? Is that we're going to solve the problem? I think that's too far out there. Uh, I don't think that at all. So that's where I sit, full spectrum. Okay, Steve. It's a great question. There's that's a huge challenge. Um, as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, as folks may know, I, I chair the Capital Budget and House. I also sit on the Health and Wellness Committee. You know, in the last six years, I wouldn't go so far as to say this was a strategy that the states developed, but those being on those two committees, we've coordinated, and also being on the Appropriations Committee, we've coordinated our capital investments in uh, with our operating investments to fund more behavioral health services in the community. And the uh, medical assisted treatment facility and uh, SWIM that the tribe has put as an example of that. Um, my opponent has a just a, I think, a lack of understanding around the state hospital system. Uh, the hospital, and we are working to replace the, the state hospital down in Silicon. It's a, over a century old. We lost actually uh, government CMS funding for that because of, uh, it's just, you know, it wasn't safe for both the employees and the patients. So we're in the process of replacing that uh, facility. We're also decentralizing, getting more care in the community. So if someone who is going through behavioral health challenges isn't shipped off to a place that's, you know, 100 miles away or 200 miles away. And we're also, I've made investments again on the capital side, all of these behavioral health a lot of our issues but in behavioral, particularly, is having a, a workforce that's able to, you know, staff these community clinics. So we're in partnership with the University of Washington. We are building a behavioral health training facility hospital in, uh, in Northwestern, it's up near Northgate. And that will provide beds, which are really important what we need, but it'll also provide training for behavioral health professionals for a four-year degree and I'll be able to develop that workforce. So we're working on doing that. We're working on, you know, getting, um, we put up in the last budget, this second year of the biennium, we had $111 million for community uh, crisis stabilization and triage centers. It was 72 million, 26 million for community behavioral health grants, and then 13 million for capital investments in the, in the state-run health facilities. But the general trend is to get away from um, large congregate behavioral health hospitals and facilities and have smaller community and, and more treatment in the, you know, in the community. On the operating side over the biennium, we put almost a billion dollars in um, allocating funding for, to support behavioral health providers and to increase their salaries so that they, you know, it's a competitive field for folks to go into. So, it's a strategy of capital investments and um, and operating budget investments to meet the challenge. We'll be more into the community. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to have a rebuttal on that one. He's, he's presented information that I don't think he can substantiate. 
where is this new facility going to be built and who will own it? The one you first talked about. Well, the, the state runs a uh, hospital. They have two major hospitals. There's Western, which is in Stilly Town. That wasn't the question, Steve. Where? Where will the new one be? And you Eastern, said, you know. and Eastern, which is in, you know, outside of Spokane. The, and there's a new hospital going to be in, where it's still come where Western is on that campus. And I think we're actually, we budgeted, um, I think, 350 million over the last two biennium. And we're probably going to have to increase that budget number to get that hospital finished. But they're, they'll start work on it probably within next year. Thank you. Okay. We need to go to closing statements. We've hit our cutout time. And um, Brian, can we ask you to go first? Two minutes. Thank you. If you thought it was rude to me to interrupt, you'll have to understand what's happened during our, our many forums we've had together. And he's made statements in his closing that I was not given an opportunity to challenge him on. One of those we had before on KONP was that he said the Republicans have six anti-abortion laws ready to go in, in legislature. That is a lie. That's six lies in one. So I'm sorry if, it, if you're uh, embarrassed by it, but accountability and integrity are extremely critical in our state legislature. We have to pursue what we need to have for infrastructure. We need to support our health system. We need to talk more about what we're going to do for our law enforcement and stop the community cost of people stealing things from your homes, getting wrecks on the highway from being inebriated or on drugs, but we need to focus on what we need to have for a healthy, thriving peninsula. And that means we need to get focused on getting better road maintenance. We need to talk about the overpasses that need to be built to get people back and forth here to the main area. We need to talk about what we're gonna to do to establish a good workforce that by age 18, kids will have an opportunity to earn a good living wage here, not just go to a home tech class, not just a few CTE courses, but we need to establish those, those baseline careers such as plumbers, carpenters, electricians, roofers, those kind of critical tasks that we need to have fulfilled on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need to change state laws to enable that so we can have those programs and those apprenticeships and develop that concept that used to be here a long time ago. And we have one good project down in Elma like that. There's one in Marysville. We need to have that on the north end of our peninsula. I've talked quite a bit to the different school, school superintendents. There's four of them working in Jefferson County trying to come up with a program to do that. So we don't continue losing 20% of our senior high school class every year across the state. We're currently giving the state school superintendent about $19,000 per student from federal funds and state funds. That does not all get down here to us where we need it in the portions that we need to have. The only way we're going to remedy that is by passing state laws that chop off the 424 curriculum and allow to have a good VOTEC program. It was one of Bremerton that lasted quite a few years where kids went to that during high school years and became as automotive technicians doing body work, doing those things that we need to have every day and available for us. If you try to get your car fixed here and swim, you may have a three to four week waiting period right now. If you have to have your septic system worked on, you may have a three week waiting period for them to come do that. And a bill will be about three to four hundred dollars for a one to two hour visit. That kind of that kind of income can be provided to people here on our peninsula. And we need to employ those kids to keep them here and give them an occupation that doesn't allow them to wander off into areas of drug addiction and depression and suicide. Okay, Steve, your closing statement, please. Well, thanks for having us. Um, great questions. Um, I'm not new, new to you. I've been doing this for a while. so. You kind of know what you get, um, and we may not always agree on everything, uh, but I'm certainly, you know, my door is always open, always open for dialogue, and always open for good suggestions. I just want to clarify a couple of things earlier. My opponent mentioned that, you know, we're wasting money on culverts. State's actually under a court injunction. The tribe one at the federal level, we have to replace those culverts. We have to replace 600 of them. The bill is going to be about $3 billion over the next decade, and we're starting to work through that that schedule. And we're also trying to work with communities, counties, and cities so that we don't have what we call ultra culverts where 
you fix one on the state road, but it doesn't, you know, it runs into a county or city over, you know, 50 feet or 100 yards up the street. So I think it's actually a good investment. It's going to open up a lot of habitat. Um, my opponent, you know, has also had this issue around misrepresentation of legislation that, that's been proposed by uh, Republicans to ban or restrict uh, women's freedom for reproductive health. And I'll just list those numbers so that he can stop asking this question. It's HB 1008, it's HB 1679, it's HB 2121, it's HB 5053, it's SB 5516, and it's SB 5625. Those are five bills, six bills that were introduced in the last two years. Said it was lower. Um, research that. And so I think that just I think it's just indicative of the the sort of disconnect or the sort of lack of uh, information and understanding that my opponent has. So uh, on a number of these issues, and um, I'd appreciate your vote uh, and it, and to be able to keep working with you to make the Olympic Peninsula an even better place. So thank you All right. for that. So, uh, Steve and Brian, thanks, thanks a million for coming. Uh, we appreciate both of your uh, participation in the election process. We well, they're going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, keep politically neutral. John, can you do this? Uh, I'm happy to. John, <laughs> <laughs> All right, see what you want. Last digits, five, seven, five. Hey, come on. Please, I could be